uh, now we have Simon and Simon giving the GHC status update. Right, just, just, just so we know the timing. Uh, half past. Oh, sorry, two o'clock. Two o'clock, right, okay. Good. Uh, well, so this is a, a quick summary of where we are on GHC, what's coming up um, in the very near future, and a um, and slightly more distant future. Just to sort of keep you posted. So, um, uh, the first thing to say about this is that one of the best things that happened, that's happened over the last uh, couple of years almost is that, that we started to get a lot more contributors to GHC. And so, this is, you know, I think we want to say a big thank you to all of you who've been willing to roll up your sleeves and get involved. I'm sure this is not an exhaustive list, um, but uh, there's a lot more people on this than there used to be. Uh, so, thank you very much for getting involved. And do, do um, you know, roll up your sleeves and join us. It's, it's turning out to be a lot of fun. Um, I somehow also feel there's, there's more, you know, more has happened in GHC land in the last year than the previous year. But furious ferment of activity. So here are some, um, uh, here's some highlights for the last, for the last uh, um, I guess, year or so. Uh, on the type system front, there's been a lot happening. Uh, so Dimitrios and I built a completely new constraint solver for the type inference engine. The old constraint solver uh, started life as a simple unification engine plus uh, a little type class constraint solver. And then it got, you know, got implicit parameters and it started to get type functions and, uh, and index types. And, and soon it was a, a tightly rolled ball of wire that I was unable to modify. You know, I would look at it and I think, I don't know what this line of code does. And it's always a dangerous situation. So, um, uh, so we threw the whole thing away and started with completely new inference engines. Now very nice and solid and robust. Um, and it's described in the paper called, um, what's called type inference with uh, under a modular type inference for something other. It's our JFP paper, a nice 70-page epic paper, which I uh, think you would enjoy reading in this. Uh, one of the uh, parts of this, this we're engineering is that um, in the, the GOT's typed intermediate language, which is a, uh, a variant of system F, for some while now, for several years now, we've had uh, explicit conversions. So a conversion is when you uh, say, so, uh, uh, the term, uh, and we cast it with a coercion. Now, this coercion gamma might have the type f of int is equal to, I don't know, bool. So here's a, here's a type function. So e has type f of int. And this whole thing has type bool. And the coercion is a kind of witness that says, oh, indeed, f of int is equal to bool. And it, and it comes with a little proof tree. And uh, internally, the, the, the language carries these, these, these things through. And as the optimizer works, it maintains these uh, coercions. Now, they previously were, were purely at the type level. So because we were planning to erase them, they don't have no runtime significance. But it turned out they're very, they play the same role as dictionaries and implicit parameters do with the process. If I write a, uh, a type like um, uh, you know, F as the type for all A, uh, EQ A, and then A is equal to F of int double arrow or something. This guy turns into an extra value parameter. And it was a bit kind of ununiform that this guy somehow turned into a type parameter or type level parameter. But now he's a value parameter. Coercions are terms, not types. And they're witnessed by values. It's just that they're witnessed by very narrow values. That values that take zero bits to represent. So this is a very nice trick because it means that they can be treated very uniformly with all other forms of evidence dictionaries and implicit parameters and so forth. Um, but yet they still cost nothing, just like types do. They still, they, you don't have to store them in data structures or pass them as arguments. We have a lot of zero-bit registers available, <laughs> even on DX86. <laughs> so uh, does that mean that all the dictionaries that take up zero bits are not mean if I have a class foo with no method? A class foo with no methods is sadly not so represented at the moment. <coughs> but uh, I would entertain a patch. <laughs> uh, so this is big solidification, really, really, uh, that, that, that builds a, so I feel we now have a foundation that can build better, better type stuff on top of. There are some small user visible consequences to this, apart from fixing many bugs. There's bits about let's not be generalized, which some of you will come across, but I lifted that a little bit recently. It's not now local let bindings are generalized, so long as they only mention top level things or other similar let bindings. It's all written out in the user manual. It makes it just a bit more flexible. Um, and I also implemented Haskell Prime semantics or static semantics for pattern bindings, which has been a bit of a 
There's been a note particularly on that. But the editor of the Haskell Prime 2010, Nolder goes here this morning. Um, Simon here, the, the Nolder, uh, made a one <laughs> overhaul of the title book class. So instead of using strings, it now uses proper, unique fingerprints. And it, that makes it less side effecty as well. So this is kind of unrelated to the rest of this week. Um, but it's in the, in the title book. Okay, so that's oh. that. Yeah. Are you type some now? Oh no, there's this long, outstanding bug. Bug 1496 <laughs> <laughs> is the dreaded new type driving bug that needs to be. No, that's still not fixed. Our pop, the Popple paper that we had, Popple 2011, describes how to fix it. But it's a somewhat. We're now in a better position to do that, but I've not done the role business that would fix that. So sadly, there is still a whole other type system for those that like those kind of things. But it makes users to feel, feel good to feel that they can cheat the compiler. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let's see. Uh, what else? Pedro. Pedro, are you here? No. Uh, um, so well, Pedro is already. Uh, uh, he's somewhere, somewhere around here. Uh, Pedro and his, his colleagues had a paper in last year's Haskell Symposium paper, I think, about an approach to generic programming. Um, uh, where, uh, well, so you, you, I'm not going to explain it because we, we'll run out of time. But it's the Utrecht approach to generic programming. And working with him, we've figured out how to split it into two very nice, independently useful features. One is this um, in a class uh, declaration, you can already give it a, a, a default. You give a type signature for the class operation. Now, in addition, you can give a uh, signature for the default method that is not necessarily identical to the signature for the method itself. So, oh, uh, what I should have done here is to also uh, write the. Uh, oh dear, I can't see my own laptop now. So can I can see both at once, please. Little computer. Yes. Can't see both at once. So if you have a kind polymorphic class, 
or kind polymorphic data type, it'll be inferred as kind polymorphic kind polymorphic. And you can use it up. And you get type level lists and type level tuples as well. Does that mean that you have rank and polymorphism on the kind level? No. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> I think not, no, at the kind level, it's just rank one polymorphism. Okay. Thank you. Good question. Yeah. Just rank one. Everything we try to do but something very simple at the kind level. Otherwise you assume we're going to extend the terms of the general. Right, yeah, so that's, that's <laughs> next year. You know, write a paper in the Haskell, the Haskell Symposium, and we'll have to implement it in the next year. That's what what kind can you use as kinds? Oh, uh, oh. <coughs> this guy you can use as a kind because he's an ordinary Haskell 98 type. Right. So you can use any type whose kind is star, 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 star. So no nested stars. GADTs. And no GADTs. Naughty! <laughs> <laughs> She's part of this project. So when you can GADTs that have star to star, I mean old style GADTs. Old style GADTs with, with type with kind star to star. I don't think so, no. Okay. We're being conservative, right? One step at a time. So if we do this, and then you start banging on the door and saying, but I can't write this fantastic program. Uh, and it will be really easy to do. But by the time we do GADTs at the type level, there will be coercions at the type level, right? And casts at the type level. And my brain is insufficient to small. I know, I know. <laughs> One step at a time. So simple thing. Eventually you get sort of simple Hindley Milner style typing at the type level and this rather richer typing at the term. What is worth. And what uh, expressions are you allowed on the type level? Oh, uh, I mean, you have the, the same ones as that. S and F. I can't have a function. You can have a type of, uh, you can have a, uh, you know, a type family function. But not a, we have not no, so in principle there, there might be certain value level functions you can live. We're not doing any of that yet. If you want functions at the type level, you've got to declare them as type families and type instances, all of that. Yeah? Um, we need closed type families now. Oh, uh, we're going to want to have closed type families, yeah. Yeah. So that, that, seems, well, that seems rather closer objective. Yeah. But not, not immediately, isn't it? I haven't done it yet. Oh, uh, let's see. Um, that's right. But in this context, maps implemented in a spare wet Sunday afternoon, implemented default type synonyms. So when you're in a class declaration, you say, here's a class declaration and here's a type family uh, that's an associated type. You can give a default declaration for that associated type that gets filled in in the usual kind of way. Um, so that's cool. Thank you, Max. Uh, here's another thing that Max did. Uh, this is a design uh, that was originally stimulated by Tom, um, Tom Schreiber's and Dominic Portrait, and then we refined a bit with Connor from Bright, and then Max uh, rolled up his sleeves, and here we are. We have a collection class like this. The insert method can't be completely polymorphic, right? C of A to A to C of A, because if you're inserting into a balanced tree, for example, you need ORD. If you're inserting into a hash table, you need hashable. So we don't know what constraint we need, it depends on C. So obviously it depends on C. Oh, damn. This is a C. That little closed object is a C. <laughs> uh, is it? Or maybe it should be a C and an A. I think, I, think I, I, think it needs a, I think it needs a C and an A. Uh, DPH, 
uh, will uh, is, is out in a kind of um, prototypical form in 7.2 and 7.4, which will be oh, our code freeze for 7.4 is meant to be the end of October, so you can expect it to actually come out at the end of November or in time for Christmas anyway. Uh, we'll have a realistically usable DPH. That's what that would, do you think that's a fair um, summary? That's the goal. Anyway. That's the goal. Right. Finally, you know, after planking up the hill, the tank has finally got to do that. Quite so this would be quite exciting about this. Um, say Pascal, so John Launchbury yesterday said uh, in 10 years' time we'll look back to uh, David's uh, uh, talk about say Pascal, which he's going to give later this afternoon, and say this was the most important paper of ICFP that year. So say Pascal is in 7.4. Uh, what will be in 7.4? Monad comprehensions. Thank you, George and Nils and uh, um, George and colleagues. Uh, so this comprehensions are now Monad comprehensions, including that a sort by and group by stuff that were that were extended list comprehensions. So it's really nice that that all generalized beautifully as well. Um, and uh, Dan, um, uh, Dan, 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 Winograd Court. Court. That's why I knew there was a reason his name was hard to remember. Dan Winograd <laughs> Court uh, from Yale and uh, Simon who did uh, uh, typing class declarations in GHCI. So you can now sit there at GHCI and type class declarations. Why would you want to do that? <laughs> Just say Colin R. But anyway, they're, they're done. <laughs> Uh, so that's all language stuff, uh, work system stuff, and um, other internals. Some of it to chunked stacks, meaning when your stack grows and it gets too big, we just allocate a new chunk. Um, uh, whereas previously we had to copy the whole stack. Is that what it's, that's right. And, and yes. Um, so rather than copying the stack so you've got a very big contiguous stack, it's just implemented in, in chunks. And this has some, in certain cases, that makes some things a lot better, doesn't it? What did it make a lot better? So the garage index doesn't have to walk the entire stack, right? Every garbage index just chunks that have changed. Oh, right, because when it's scanned, then the garbage index is scanned. You know, it scans whole things. Right? That's right. So it improves garbage collection. Yes. Great. Um, Johan, thank you, Johan. You implemented some uh, uh, new printing <coughs> operations for bit population count and array copying. Um, it makes some inner loops. But the fact that people are beginning to worry about how inner loops are. Uh, you know, what's happening in the loops of Haskell program, I take it to be a very good sign. Um, better support for cross population. Uh, interruptible FFI, what does this mean? If you're in the middle of a foreign function call and you press Control C, you'd like something good to happen. Thank you, Edward Yang, for doing that. He's an undergraduate at MIT. Very much. Chat, he's not here, I'm afraid. Um, Max, who comes up rather a lot in these, in these things, implemented compiler plugins. So now you can, uh, you can sit there and write a, write a plugin which uh, is dynamically linked with the compiler at compile time, runs an optimization class written by you on your core program and then, and then carries on. So it's a way of kind of dynamically extending GNC without having to apply it to headquarters. Uh, always a good plan. So I'm implemented local garbage collection, meaning that each processor in a parallel system could do its own garbage collection without talking to the others, and then occasionally they participate and do global garbage collection together. This was a lot of work. We had a lot of whiteboard ink was expended on this, uh, and a lot of Simon's brain cells and uh, fingertips were worn out. And sadly, the result was it went a little bit faster, but not enough to justify the extra complexity in the garbage collector, because it was jolly complicated. Right? So, in the end, there's a branch that has it, but the, the main trunk does not. And finally, the long march that we tell you about every year that to the new, the glorious new code generation technology continues. Simon and I occasionally spend a couple of days working hard on the new code generation path. It's a longer path. Uh, profiling. So you want to say something about profiling, right? So I'm going to skip this. Um, profiling is better code stuff. That's what you're going to talk about, right? Yeah. So I'm just going to skip this just to say. Are you going to show sparkles? He's yeah. already shipped to... That was already this morning. Okay, so I'm sorry, I need to do that. Okay, good. So, we're running at 200 commits a month. I look back six months, and it's average is 200 commits a month. That's quite a lot. That's how I many, you know, what's that, 10 a day? Oops. Six a day or something. And the commit is usually more than just adding a comment. So, uh, <laughs> it really is a lot going on in JC. We're having a great time. And it's, um, I think, increasingly, the, 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 it seems to be... It seems to be the point where they, maybe the, you know, the, uh, the learning curve has lowered or there's a big enough community of people willing to help. Somehow it seems to be a bit easier to get into than it, than it used to. So please join in. 
The only reason that JXE works is because it's got such a large surface area now, you know, on n different platforms, on a few different operating systems, with few different language extensions. The cost product is very large. It only works because people are prepared to take responsibility for bits. So please step up and say, well, I'll look after that aspect that we've already got for us. And thank you for what you've done so far. Simon, you want to talk a bit more about programming stuff, right? Patrick identified the difference between what he called 
lexical scoping and evaluation scoping. So to give you an idea of what the difference is, imagine the simple program main equals map fx's. Uh, in under lexical scoping, the kind of stack you might have is that main called f. That's because the call site of f is lexically inside the body of main. Whereas in, under evaluation scoping, which is kind of the dynamic call site, the stack you might see is main called map and map called f. Right? So there are a few different ways you can think about this. So evaluation scoping gives you the same stack that you might see if we were in this program in the strip language. Uh, lexical scoping gives you the stack that you obtain by looking at the source code and just tracing through the various call types and functions. Um, you can annotate your program with a user annotation on the profile program called Cross Center. Um, and under evaluation scoping, the SCC captures the costs all the way up to any lambda expressions you've got inside there. Whereas lexical scoping goes under the lambdas as well. So when those lambdas are reapplied, possibly many times by your program. Lexical scoping would attribute those costs to the to the transaction. So there's a few different ways to understand the difference. And there's, there's lots of differences. So, uh, so uh, GXC, as it happens, implements, it tries to implement stacks with lexical scoping. That's what it promises to do. <coughs> really understand how to do this at the time. And many times since then, I've tried to understand. I'm not sure there is a good way to do it. So, the new plan is to switch to evaluation scope. And it turns out that's, uh, well, first of all, some of the undesirable properties of lexical scope we've had that I've discovered is that uh, if you kind of abstract <coughs> a variable, if you just introduce a left binding for x equals y in fx, that has a different meaning under lexical scope than just f of y. So, there's some very undesirable properties. Uh, and it turns out that lexical scoping really restricts the transformations of the simplified uh, And we didn't fully understand which transformations were about. So, evaluation scoping is much easier. Like, the idea is I deleted lots of code from the user, and it doesn't like it. And it's easy to explain to users, it's just the stuff you would get if you imagine evaluating the program uh, under, the, under the strict evaluation strategy. I've got HPC and GNC 
CCI working again, um, and profiling is now working. Uh, so one nice uh, extra feature I've added is that Auto All now decorates the nested bindings as well, not just the top of the bindings, but also the sort of uh, where bindings every, uh, in fact, every lab expression inside the uh, binding gets out of the approach. So, and uh, then we'll be pleased that the edge is now correct. Um, and hopefully now we can do more optimizations than before because, because we understand how we can uh, watch conservations and value. If I get it finished in time, it'll be in 7 4. Okay, here's uh, a go so back. If we move to here, will <laughs> <laughs> we? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'll be here. I've been working through the lines of that. That's right, I've been working through the lines of Here's a profile generated by the new system for the closet flow program. sort of function dot function as well is what happens when you get a sort of nested function by the top level this is the top level function and this is the, the nested function. So there's a lot more information coming out here. Uh, when you get one of these that's a pattern binding. I need to think about it. Maybe you can sort of some way we can uh, generate more useful ones for us. What is what is what? The third column. You know. Oh number. Uh, so each of these is a cost of the stack of
just considered to be in, inside the, the Haskell code recording. That's what she's talking about. Okay. Was so that in that uh, Peter Woodman uh, was talking about was that after, after optimization, a lot of these ticks uh, end up in the same place. There's lots of code from Finland yeah. together, and you get a whole bunch of ticks. So it's a uh, runtime, it's tick, 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 tick. Yeah. And, and he was just thinking, can we somehow map them all to one? So they do one tick, and then do a bit of post processing. Post processing I won't be in the, in the, the, no, the two that's, examples. That's the right result. Right? So the, the, the semantics of tick is just that it, it's. Oh, sure, sure. Yeah, you're not trying to change the meaning. Okay. Because they're separate ticks. But we want to at one time do one tick to one counter, which will count towards all those other end ticks. Oh, so it's a measure of performance. Yeah, so yeah. exactly, the performance not changing the meaning. Yeah. Uh, uh, sure, yeah. Does that seem important? It does indeed. I'm sure there are lots of cases where we're, we're generating too many ticks as well. That we, um, we try and optimize away some cases where an inner tick definitely depends on the outer tick, so we don't bother creating the extra tick. So what you'll see now, if you, if you do profiling, is all the ticks get lifted up to the top, and the cost centers stay in the right place. So they have different transformation semantics. Do you plan to put these stack rates in the exception on objects? That, that's a very fine idea. 